Hi guys, I'm Lisa. Welcome back to the channel. Once I filed my claim with EEOC, I was ready for EEOC to investigate. I felt like I had enough evidence to make my case and I was looking forward to my chance to do that. But like most things with the EEOC process, my investigation wasn't what I expected. It was nothing at all like the crime shows I watch on TV. Today I'm going to share about some of the trap doors that I ran into in my investigation. These are things that can really mess you up if you don't know to look out for them. And I'm also going to talk about some of the good things you might bump into. When I was writing these down, I actually came up with too many to share in just one video. So today is going to be part one. Trap door one, believing all investigators work for EEOC. My investigator was an independent contractor to NASA. In the federal sector, the agency being complained about is essentially responsible for investigating itself. I learned that when I was getting close to my investigation and I went to the FedSoup forums to ask for tips on how to prepare. Everybody who answered me warned me about this and how it can create bias in favor of the agency. And if your agency is one of those that has an in-house staff to perform the investigations, people that are actually on the payroll, it could be even worse for you. An EEOC investigator is not your friend. They're supposed to be impartial fact finders. And to help ensure that, EEOC has a compliance manual that every investigator is supposed to follow. I'll link to that in the description. In the weeks between filing your EEOC claim and the start of your investigation, it's a good idea to study it. That way, as your investigation progresses, you'll be able to recognize if your investigator does anything unusual, and you'll be able to ask diplomatic questions about it, or at least you can make note of it and mention it in your rebuttal to the report of investigation at the end. And it's also a great guide to understanding the process overall. Trapdoor 2. Expecting your investigation to resolve the dispute. The point of an EEOC investigation isn't to figure out who done it. It's to develop a balanced body of evidence that's relevant to your claims of discrimination. No matter how strong your evidence is, the investigator isn't going to find your employer guilty on the spot and tell him to stop the discrimination. Unfortunately, we don't get that. But what we do get is a body of evidence that's been gathered from both sides, compiled and vetted by a person who knows the process better than we do. And that can help a lot. My investigator was able to get detailed statements from every one of NASA's witnesses. I never could have gotten those on my own. There was one witness that wouldn't give me a statement at all, but he told the investigator about a time when he tried to convince my boss and me to discuss my medical issues and what we needed to do to work around those. In other words, he told us that we should be discussing reasonable accommodation. <laughs> and the fact that he recognized that and my boss didn't really helped my case. I had a ton of evidence, but I didn't really have any idea how to pull it together into a coherent story that EEOC would understand. My investigator did a great job making sense of all the scattered little pieces of evidence, allegations, and pretext flying back and forth between NASA and me. The report of investigation that she developed made it much clearer to me exactly how NASA had discriminated. It had also pointed out gaps in my case, which gave me a chance to fill those gaps with evidence before my hearing. And vetting the evidence was a tremendous help. My boss tried to bring in a lot of witnesses to vouch for her character and against mine. One of those was a very close personal friend of hers who wasn't in my chain of command. He was supposed to back up her pretext about me being frequently AWOL. He said he'd seen me leaving the office in the middle of the day all the time and he kept notes about when I did it. My investigator asked me if I agreed he should be a witness, and of course I didn't. And here's a condensed version of the objections that I made. He didn't witness any of the discrimination. This person wasn't my supervisor, so he couldn't have possibly known when I was authorized to leave or not. I had some duties that required me to do things off-site. <laughs> After hearing all that, my investigator decided not to interview that witness which meant that I didn't have to deal with this foolishness at my hearing. Trapdoor 3. Failing to report new discriminatory behavior that occurred after you filed your original claim. NASA delayed my investigation for about nine months after I first requested reasonable accommodation. And during that time, my boss would frequently come into my office and throw tantrums over petty little things. She'd twist the smallest little things into proof that I was disrespecting her and was being insubordinate, and she'd threaten to fire me over it. And it was during that same period of time when the diversity manager threatened to put me on a PIP on her behalf. HR in the legal office helped with that. 
I chose not to expose all that during my investigation. I urgently needed to be reasonably accommodated, and I thought there was still some hope of that. I thought if I made a big deal of every little thing that my boss did, or dragged everybody that helped her into the middle of an investigation, I'd ruin any chance I had at peacefully resolving my complaint and getting reasonably accommodated. So I kept my claim focused on my boss's discriminatory actions. In retrospect, I wish I'd told my investigator everything and given her the evidence that I'd gathered to prove those things. If I'd done that, I think that I would have had a very good retaliation case, in addition to the failure to accommodate claim that I won. So that's it, guys. Part one of my trapdoors to avoid in your EEOC investigation. We'll cover part two next week. Until then, take care and hang in.